All right, good afternoon, and let's continue with chapter seven. So now we're going to talk about the MAC address table. Um, so at layer two, the switch itself learns and the learns the MAC addresses to make forwarding decisions. So we're going to take a look at the the, the, the switch itself and how it learns the MAC addresses and how does it really avoid the carrier since sense multiple access with collision detection by the way the mac address table sometimes is referred to as the content addressable memory amp and you'll see that in a lot of books so please write this down mac address table equal amp content addressable memory because you'll see that a lot especially in in other books as we uh, start covering this later on all right so what happened as i, I know i discussed this on the last video so what the switch is going to do is he's going to learn the MAC addresses. How does the switch learn the MAC addresses, which port they are located in? So what they do is they look at the source MAC address of an incoming frame and they know which port they are coming from. So they'll know, for example, MAC address A is coming from port 5. So therefore, MAC address A is located at port 5. Because why would MAC add... Why would the frame be stamped with the source MAC address A unless he's located at port 5? All right, so that's how he learns it. And the final destination MAC address is we're doing it by an ARP request. Remember that? So if the incoming frame, then after I learn the MAC address, I look at the destination MAC address that's on the frame. That's what the switch does. Looks at the destination MAC address. And when it looks at the destination MAC address, if and he looks up the MAC address table and he doesn't see where that destination MAC address is located. He doesn't know which port it's located at. Then he floods the frame. So here's another note. How, what does the switch do? Here's another question. What does the, I want you to write this down. Here's question number one. You should know. How does the switch learn where the MAC addresses are located? And the answer is by inspecting the incoming source incoming frame by inspecting the source mac address that is stamped on the incoming frame and knowing what port they are coming from number two what does the switch do when the destination mac address is not located in the uh in the MAC address table. What does he do with, with the frame? He sends the frame to all the ports. He floods the frame. That's the answer. All right, so when you send in your frame, you look at the source MAC address. You're coming from port one. So therefore, 0A, 000A is located at port one because the switch has inspect the source MAC address. He knows that it's coming from port one, so that's what I put in the MAC address table. I look at the destination MAC address. If it's in the chart, if it's in the MAC address table, wonderful. So all I have to do is send it to him, right? So that's the importance of having the MAC address table. So when you have everybody listed in the MAC, all these guys are listed in the MAC address table, every incoming frame will be sent to him only. Right? So therefore, you're directly connected. That's where the word switching is. You're switching directly to your destination, and you don't have to bother anyone else. And therefore, CSMA slash CD is really not needed because you're kind of directly connected to your destination, no matter what. You can go in so fast, you don't even have to wait until you, until you get to your destination. Right, So you can go through at full bandwidth. All right, so let's continue on. There are several types of frames. Um, there is the store and forward, which means when the freight comes in, when the frame comes in, it's, it's stored, we look at it, and before we send it out. And we look at it, that means it's for error switching. So number, I want you to write this down. Stored and forwarding switching and the cut through. Store and forward is uh creates latency delay but it and the but the advantage is that it's um uh, it has error detection right because we look at it if it, if the frame is corrupted we drop it 
If it's not weird, let it go. But it creates delay. Cut through, on the other hand, we just look at the destination and we send them out to you. We send them out to the destination very quickly. And without, there's no error detection. So cut through, uh, the advantages of cut through is that um, the speed, right? No latency, but no error detection. Well, to come fast forward over the lowest of the, uh, uh, the lowest type of latency. So by immediately forwarding the packet, reading the destination. This, so this is a kind of cut through, right? But the but there is another like a compromise, for example, something called fragment free. So this is important. If you remember the Ethernet frame that we talked about earlier, the minimum frame size with the destination, you know, 46. Remember I told you it's 46 plus um, 40 uh, MAC addresses, 46 bytes. The, the two MAC addresses are uh, six bytes and six bytes. That's 12. And the FCS, FCS is um, four bytes. Well, 46 plus two plus six for the Mac plus six for the Macs. That's 64 bytes. That's the minimum frame size that you have to have. Anything less than that is no good. It's called a fragment. So please write this down. A fragment is any frame that is less than 64 bytes. That's why I always said that the, um, the packet size has to be at least 46 because 46 plus the two MAC addresses, which is 12, plus the, um, the FCS, which is four, that's 64 bytes, right? So anything less than that is a fragment. So what a fragment free switch does is when the frame comes in, I just look at the size of it. If it's less than 64 bytes, I drop it. I don't let it go. If it's more than 64 bytes, I let it go to its destination. That doesn't mean it's good, but uh, there's a very good chance that it's a good byte, that it's a good frame, right? So fragment free switches is you set a, you actually looking at the minimum size of the frame. Anything less than 64 bytes, you don't let it go through the switch. Anything greater than 64 bytes, you let them through. So that's kind of a compromise between storm forward and fast forwarding. Now, when the frame goes into the switch, all switches have memory. So each, each port has a memory. So every workstation that's connected to the switch will have a reserved memory, port base. So every port has a memory. So when I send that data, to port 16, let's say, and I'm in port one, I'm sending the data to port 16 memory, right? So if I'm running at 100 megabits per second and he's running at 10 megabits per second, I can send all the data to his reserved memory and just leave him alone and I can do whatever I wanna do and he can download his stuff from his memory at his leisure, right? This allows us to have different types of speeds connected to the switch. Now, the problem is what happens if I want to send him more than what his memory can handle? I have to wait till he downloads the stuff. So what we do is we use shared memory. If no one else is connected, we're giving the, all of the memory in the switch to port 16. So I can fill it up and just go and move on. If more people want, uh, want to communicate, then they share, the memory is shared between all the active ports that are using the switch. All right, so there are two types of memory buffering, port-based, please write this down, and shared memory. It's a good idea to write a sentence for each one of them describing what each one is. All right, duplex and speed setting. Here's another thing I want you to always remember. The switch will always negotiate two modes. That, that's a question that always comes up on the CCNA test. What are the two modes that a switch negotiates with a host? And the answer is the duplex mode because your NIC could be half duplex, full duplex, and the speed. You could be 10 megabit, 100 meg, or a thousand or a gigabit Ethernet. So the switch says, okay, are you full duplex? This, the port on the switch will say, okay, this guy's full duplex. I got to be able to send and receive data and i'll ask them what you know what's your speed are you a gigabit then i'll know 
how fast he's going to be able to transmit data to you. All right. Typically, they are both set up at auto to automatically negotiate. But if you go to the switch and you say duplex mode full, and you go to the port on the switch, also you say uh, speed, you know, speed is 1000, which is a gigabit. That means there's no negotiation. You better be full duplex and you, the host, better be um, a gigabit Ethernet. Otherwise, we're not letting you through. So please write, I told you to write this down, right? The two modes that the switch will negotiate if the uh, will if the ports are set up as auto, will negotiate with a host. And the answer is full duplex and half duplex. All right, so that's that. We talked about that. Auto MDIX, this is also important. Uh, please write this down. This is to let you know that we really no longer need to worry about crossover cable. So all we need to do is connect the straight through cable to the switch. The switch is going to recognize that you have a straight through cable and will automatically, if it needs to connect, or the NICs, by the way, if I connect one, one PC to another PC, the NIC on my PC will recognize that I have an, a straight through cable and will send the data on ports one and two and receive them on, on pins one and two and receive them on ports uh, three and six. And if you connect a, a straight through cable between two switches, the same thing is going to happen. The NDX are automatically connected on the switch and they will say, hey, this guy has a straight through cable. I have to transmit on pins one and two and receive on pins three and six for Ethernet. So the switches, you know, we don't have to worry about creating a special crossover cable to connect similar devices to each other anymore because Ethernet, uh, NICs, and switches have the auto MDX enabled to be able to recognize the type of cable that's connected and immediately adjust. All right, that's it for this chapter, chapter seven. So please write down what I told you and submit that uh, and upload that as homework. All right, I'll see you on the next chapter.